Divine Truth Events These are events and presentations by Jesus and Mary. This presentation is part of the General Questions series, and it is a question and answer session from people in Kentucky, presented by Jesus and Mary Magdalene on the 31st of August 2013 in Kentucky, New South Wales, Australia. This is part two. Yeah. Nice spread, guys. Very nice. Yeah. Now, now you've got to give it a bit of time to get to your waist. <laughs> That's what the next two hours is about. <laughs> Getting it all on that waist. <laughs> yeah. Okay, who's, who's next? It's uh, Sess. Let's come down to Sess and then back up to Rach. Jesus and Mary, my question's about anger. Um, I know you've said a great deal already about anger. Mm -hmm. I seem to have a very, very big problems with connecting to and expressing my anger. Mm -hmm. And I remember you saying that uh, if Mary doesn't get into her anger, uh, you know, just <laughs> at, at, I'm quote from a DVD, something, yes. just... As an example, right? If Mary doesn't get into her grief within a couple of minutes, then she knows that there's a spirit there. So she talks to the spirit and then usually she can get into the grief. So, and I also recall you saying earlier on um, in DVDs that there was a man who needed to bash for two hours a day in the morning and at night for three weeks before he could feel any grief. That's right. Yeah. And I feel... That I'm not getting, I'm not getting it. That's the feedback I'm getting as well. I connect to feeling my rage as a baby and screaming and screaming with the rage and frustration and powerlessness and not being able, um, I can, and I feel that it, I can feel it coming out of my body, but then I don't connect to the grief straight away by any means. Um, so then I'm praying and sometimes later I just start crying at some delayed point. But I just feel I don't really know what to do now. Well, let's talk about it, shall we? I think I'll get out there. I think we'll draw some things, I reckon. I think you've done amazing to get so far into a talk and not Yeah, without life. drawing. <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay. Um, you need to understand there's two types of anger, firstly. So, so if we're looking at anger, there's two types. There's the type that comes when others actually treat you badly. Right? And this usually occurs during our childhood. And it usually is not able to be expressed. Most of the time because our parents do not want it to be expressed. If you think about it, even if you've had it, been a parent, if your child has ever gotten angry with you or frustrated what you've done to them in order to suppress their anger, usually we do have quite strong response, don't we, to our child's anger. And most of us, when we were children, had our parents respond in the same way, in the sense that we, we had this response of them wanting to shut down our anger and telling us that our anger was inappropriate. And most of us weren't allowed to experience it at the time. Now, a lot of the, unfortunately, in our childhood, a lot of the anger that we were expressing was the result of being treated unlovingly and having a feeling inside of ourselves that we were treated unlovingly. Or, so there were two primary causes. One was that there was an unloving cause where we were unlovingly treated. The other one was that we were just having a tantrum. Um, in other words, that <clears throat> we were not getting what we wanted and we learnt to use anger as a method of getting what we wanted. <clears throat> so
So how many of you learnt to use anger as a method to get what you want when you were little? Do you, can you remember doing that? Many of us don't remember doing that, actually. It's interesting. However, that is the main one we use as an adult as well. So I want to put an R in there for some reason. I don't know why that is. But So in other words, a tantrum is the result of us not getting what we want. So <clears throat> when we look at anger, when we're trying to work our way through anger, the question we've really got to ask ourselves is, is this kind of an anger like a childlike kind of an anger or is this the kind of anger that we're just expressing because we're not getting what we want? Now, for the majority of us, it's the kind of anger we're expressing because we're not getting what we want. In other words, we've learnt that when we don't get what we want, we just get angry. And, the, and usually, the people around us generally conform when we are angry with them. They will generally be afraid of our anger, and as a result, we'll end up getting at least some of what we wanted. <coughs> Excuse me. Now... On the divine way to God, on the, you know, God, the, what you call the divine love path, we are often in this phase with God. Many of us are in this phase with God right now because we do not want to, do not want to feel. That's the main reason why we're like that. So to be really sincere about anger and what's going on inside of you with regard to anger, you're going to have to work out whether you're angry because you're just not getting what you want or whether it's actually a childhood thing that happened to you that was unloving that you're getting angry about now. Does that make sense? Now, usually, if it's a childhood thing that was unloving that you're now getting angry about, very rapidly you'll get into the sadness of it. Because it's the unloving feeling that, that, that the anger is covering that gets exposed quite rapidly. But if you are just having a tantrum and it's just not, you're not getting what you want, you can go on like that for years, having, expressing rage, just having a tantrum, expressing rage, having a tantrum and actually get nowhere with your soul at all. Because you're not looking at what you want. You're not looking at feeling the addiction. You don't want to feel that the addiction is actually something that's out of harmony with love. And you need to determine the difference. I have had some <coughs> success in having the tantrum of not getting what I want or, or that I don't want to feel. Um, I have had some success in actually breaking into feeling only because I realised, God, I'm angry <laughs> and I don't want to feel. And I, in that, open myself to the truth that I'm going to have to feel. But I, ha but I expressed rage and got deeper. But I've spent years just having a tantrum about not wanting to feel and not dissipated that anger about that topic. It's only when I've been open to new truth that that to the truth, really, that I have to be there's, willing to feel. <laughs> there's something you're afraid of here yeah. that you don't want to feel and you're using anger as a method of feeling powerful in order to not feel it. And the majority of people who are in, the ra in rage are in this space here. Very few uh, who are in rage are in that space over there where other people have actually treated them badly and they're actually feeling about the childhood reason why that seems to happen regularly in their life. Most people are in this place where it's just a big tantrum because you don't want to have to feel and you feel that God's made it all up wrong. Why should you have to feel when other people have done the damage to you? They should have to feel instead. And there's all sorts of things we come up with in that place as to why we shouldn't have to do the feeling. Does yeah. that help, sense? Yeah. So the question you've got to ask yourself is which one is it? If it's the first one where it's related to the child, the child and it's a childlike expression of anger, 
then it's probably a lot of childhood frustration that's coming out. But when that comes out, it's unlikely it will come out for long periods of time, like months and months and months, without you also experiencing a lot of grief. Does that make sense? And so this is where I feel you need to be careful because of you have knowledge of some events that happened in your childhood and you can sort of associate <coughs> the anger with those events. It's like a, it's a way of avoiding the fear that's underneath the tantrum. Do you understand what I mean? Yeah. Yep. Keep relating it to... Keep relating it to what? It's childhood, it's childhood, it's this thing. When really it can just be the fear that you don't want to feel about your childhood and you're having a tantrum about it. And what I see a lot of people doing too, by choice, is that they remember something that was in their childhood and whenever they get angry, they blame their anger on that childhood event. But that's really the adult avoiding having a tantrum. Does that make sense? It's not actually feeling about the childhood event. It's just the adult having a tantrum about the childhood event. So if I confront my fears and... Can, can I suggest, if you're getting angry, you don't want to confront your fears. So what I would do is I would feel I don't want to confront my fears. Mm. I would say I don't want to. Instead of telling myself I have to, I would say I'm getting angry because I don't want to. And mm. feel how much you don't want to. And the irony when you do that, you'll actually get into some of them. <laughs> It's a, it's, a, it's a weird thing that happens inside of us when we allow ourselves to feel actually what we don't want. So that many of you feel like, I have to get to my fears. Like, how many of you feel you have to get to your fears? Otherwise something bad will happen or the law of attraction will happen and it would be terrible. Or, you know, I've got to do it if I want a relationship with God or I've got to do it if I want to a relationship. So quite a lot of people that... But now, how many of you feel like you want to get into your fears? Depends which ones. And even those of you have have your hand up. Some of them, I'd agree. Not all of them, because <laughs> I notice you're not. You're in a lot of addiction with with the majority of them. So, so when we're in addiction, what we're basically saying to ourselves is, I don't want to feel fear. I want to have all of my fears go away. I want them all satisfied by something else. I want somebody else to take them all away. I want God to take them all away. You know, you promised me this divine love path would be, would be the way to God and I'd be happy at the end and I'm not happy at all and it's all your fault, Jesus, because you told me that it was all good and it's not all good. And like even having someone to blame is a great thing you know, when you're in that place of addiction. We gotta, we've got to own those emotions. We've got to feel those emotions. You won't, you won't get deeper if you don't feel those emotions. And get down to what you don't want to feel, which is all about your fears. Mm. That's what it's all about. So can I ask, when I do confront my fears and act more in desire, which I have done, mm -hmm. I have found that I'm happier. Mm -hmm. I'm then... I don't feel like I'm going and bashing, like, I, I'm like, oh, right. I'm not really doing bashing. I'm, I'm starting to cry about exactly. things. I'm crying on the job because I'm, my desire is actually creating all this, giving me all these things to feel about. Exactly. And that's what happens. So this is. feels better. Yeah, yeah. But and it is better. Right. So yeah. it was more my question about, oh, well, if I'm so enraged, which I know I'm, and I've always felt that I could yep. kill someone. In fact, I did kill my baby because, you know, abortion, yeah. because I was so afraid that I would do that. And yeah. then I went and did it before I was even born. Yeah. So I've always been aware of that rage I've got. Yeah. But I was worried that, well, if I'm not actually physically bashing, then I'm not expressing my rage. So. But it, but can you see you you've now gone and done the opposite of what I've just suggested? What I just suggested is that you've got to determine the two different types of rage. And you've now lumped them all back in together into one pie again in your comment. You're not seeing the two different times. Do you, do you understand? Oh, that was what I was worried about, but I feel... But oh. this is what you're doing all the time. You're, you're getting all of these two different types of rage and putting them in one basket, right? And they're not the same. Each one has different motivations. Each one has different things that you're going to have to experience. And what you're doing is you're putting them all in one basket again, even in, your, even in the way you think you're putting them all in one basket. 
everything you say, you're putting them in one basket. <laughs> so the question becomes, why do you want to put all of them in one basket? There's obviously got to be a fear associated with one type of anger that you don't want to feel. So I feel you're quite okay with experiencing this type of anger. You're quite okay with the tantrum. And to be honest, the majority of people are quite okay with the tantrum. Because the tantrum comes from this place of, I'm not getting what I want. They should be giving me what I want. Other people should do what I want. That's where it comes from. We feel justified having the tantrum. But this, this one over here, this, this rage over here, being treated unlovingly as a child and then being suppressed as a result of it, that's the anger that the majority of people don't want to touch at all. Because that one feels very, very different than the other. And it's quickly linked to deep grief and, and terrible fears that we often don't want to face. And this is where you have to separate the type of angry experiences. You have to ask yourself, which one's just me having a tantrum about not getting what I want? And which one is really about a childhood feeling that I was, I was enraged and, and not able to experience the rage? All right. Now, as I've said, the majority of times it's this one for the majority of people. Uh, when it's this one, this other one, it goes, you, it goes through you and passes out of you very quickly. It's not something that you live with for weeks and weeks and months and months on end. It's not like that. When you're in this one over here, it's like... Just let me have a cough again. So when it's uh, this one over here from your childhood, it's, it's one of those things where you get into it and within, usually within seconds to minutes, you're already in the terror and fear and grief. And it's all sort of mixed together, the childhood things that you, that, that you have, were suppressed with. And a lot of the times it just comes out of you and you, you only know afterwards what it was all about. Right? With this one here, if you allow yourself to think about, about the anger, most of the time you know exactly what it's about. You know, oh, yeah, I'm just having a tantrum actually. And I'm just complaining that such and such didn't treat me well or, you know, God hasn't given me my soulmate yet or, you know, you know whatever it is that, that, you, that you're upset about at the time, you're just having a tantrum about. Mm. And often it's directed at God because God can't, is not going to fight you back. Or it's directed at a person who is gentle uh, and long-suffering because they're not going to fight you back. Very rarely is it directed at people who can punch you in the nose, this kind of anger. <laughs> Does that make sense? Because we're so afraid to express our real self to a person who's going to punch us in the nose. All right, so what we do is we suppress all of our rage and anger under those circumstances and we only express it to people who will allow it around us. And this is a pattern that we get into then. We dump all of our anger and rage on people who are going to accept it and the real anger and rage that we feel are, is about the other people who don't, you know, who caused us damage, not, 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 not the people who were gentle with us. So often if it's aimed at somebody who is a lot, you know, who's gentle or meek or mild and generally easy to get along with, then I would suggest to you that it's just a tantrum about something else. Yeah. So that's a very overt sort of anger. The tantrum one. And the other one, I might not even notice that I'm angry if the law of attraction thing takes me straight into the grief. You'll probably notice it afterwards or you'll feel it afterwards or during. But, uh, and you'll certainly feel it if it's a real it. rage. You, you mm. have a lot of real rage to experience from your childhood. Mm. Your family obviously was heavily suppressed as children. Mm. And uh, both yourself and your sister have a different way of handling that suppression. Your sister mm. is overtly angry and you are, you are what I'd call a passive-aggressive with, with your anger. But, and, but your sister is overtly angry. Um, both of you have to ex experience wh why you are angry. And a lot of your anger is about this, not getting what you want out of life. But we have to somehow connect it to... The child, oh, no, not at all. That's what you're saying. It's quite separate. Just feel what you wanted. Oh. Feel what you wanted. Why are you having the tantrum? Feel what you want. 
Like, so why are you having the tantrum? So when, you, when you're screaming and carrying on, what, what is it about? It's about ultimately how I feel about myself. The grief underneath. Yes, the and layers. That, see, I, I, I don't feel can so. I, yeah. Mm. Says, can I say something that I observe? And that is that you have a certain set of emotions that you feel comfortable acknowledging inside of yourself. Definitely. And then there's this whole other part of cess that you don't want to discover um, because it scares you and it doesn't meet up with this idea of who you would like yourself to be or who you feel is good and kind and loving. Like there's parts of you that are not so good and kind and loving yet and I notice that you have – you feel quite comfortable crying about some things and feeling about some things. But often that's avoiding – what you're really attracting or what God's trying to show you through attractions. Mm. And some of that stuff is about demands on others and addictions. Yep. Don't you agree with that? Yeah, yeah, and when those addictions and demands don't get met, you get angry. And a lot of your anger is about the addictions and demands that are not getting met. And this is where you have to be honest. And honest in that moment, who am I angry at and why am I angry? Don't, go, don't try to analyse it back to something that I'm more comfortable with. Yeah. Like, oh, it's about me or it's about my childhood or it's about something that's not going to confront this idea that I have that I'm nice and kind and loving to everyone around me all the time. Uh, the challenge is to go, nah, I'm mad at them because they didn't give me what I want. I want to be looked after by men. They should do it. And when they don't, I feel angry with them. I feel like I want to hurt them. I feel like I want to make their life miserable. I feel, you know, be honest about what you feel. And the tantrum is a lot about that. And then what you try to do is you link it, you try to link it to something else in your head because, then, because to link it to the thing that's really true makes you feel like you're a terrible person. And you don't want to feel like you're a terrible person because that's one of the addictions. And so what you do instead is you make out that it's something else. When really it's just having a tantrum because a man didn't do what you want or something similar like that. Something simple, actually. Often it's really simple, but we, mm -hmm. we like try to psychoanalyse ourselves back to something where we feel comfortable again about mm -hmm. who we are and why we might be getting angry. We have to justify it uh, to ourselves. Otherwise it might mean us confronting that we're not that kind right now. Yeah. Like the majority of women on the planet are totally enraged about men. They don't even know why half the time. Because oftentimes they've treated men just as badly as men have treated them. But, but they feel like men are worse. And they feel completely justified that, that that's a great reason to be angry with them. And so when a man doesn't give you security that you feel you need, bang, you're in a rage or... When man hasn't, a man hasn't given you the sexual attention you wanted from that particular man, you're in a rage. Or if man gave you sexual attention and you didn't want it from him, you're in a rage. And, do you know what I mean? It just, if it's a nice, good-looking man, then it's good that he gives you sexual attention. But if it's not a good-looking man, then it's not. And, or if it's somebody... Do you know what I mean? We've got all these selectivities all about what, what we believe we should get. And then as a result of that, we get in a rage every time that particular thing isn't satisfied. And we've got to be honest about the feelings that we want. That makes sense. And I just have to trust that, um, that God will show me, <coughs> that I'll find out what's underneath that and, and that I'll You know the only recover. way you'll find out what's underneath? It's just to feel what's on top. Mm. That's the only way mm. you can confidently find what's underneath. Mm. And it doesn't even matter if I tell you what's underneath. Mm. You won't know... For yourself till you felt it. And the good thing is you will know for sure once you feel it. And nobody else will be able to convince you any different. <laughs> That's the irony. Yeah. You'll yeah. know for certain and nobody else will be able to tell you any different once it's the real thing. Mm. Yeah. You're fishing for what the reasons are. God is already telling you exactly what the reasons are but you don't want to know the reasons. Cause, and that's what causes us to go fishing. Yeah. Right? The reality is our life through the law of attraction. The law of attraction and the law of cause and effect work perfectly every single time. They are telling you exactly what the problem is every single time. But we are often fishing for a solution that's not the one that the law of attraction is telling us. Right? 
And this is in particular the case with anger. This is what I see people doing with anger all the time. Instead of, instead of seeing anger as a problem within themselves, instead of seeing it as something that's unloving within themselves, most people don't see their anger as that. They see it as something somebody else did. Right? Not as something that's unloving inside of themselves as an expectation. You only get angry when you expect something. You only have this kind of anger when you expect something and you don't get it. And that might be just walking down the street and you expect that nobody laughs at you. That might be the... Now, from God's perspective, people are allowed to laugh at you. They have free will. So if you expect that everyone doesn't laugh at you, and then when you get angry with anybody who does, you're already out of harmony with God's law of free will. And, and you're not seeing it as something inside of yourself. You're seeing it as, they're laughing at me. Look at how unloving they are. <laughs> how dare they do that to me? And go up and tell them, you know, you're not a very nice person at all. And <laughs> we get all upset about it. And in the end, we're the one being unloving. Firstly, we had the unloving expectation that they don't laugh at us. And secondly, we then dump on them all of our anger and rage about them laughing at us. And both of those things are an indication of the tantrum that we're in because our expectations are not getting met. Does that make sense? And, and what I've had to do with anger is I've had to look at all of my unloving expectations. And I've had to feel about what their causes are. So, for example, what I've had to do is go through emotions like when, when other people, like we brought up earlier when I was talking to um, Lincoln. Lincoln about the um, about the situation at home, you know, with, with people coming on the property and doing all of these things and feeling quite angry and frustrated with it. Well, firstly... What I've had to do is work through. Why did I have an expectation that anybody listens to me? And then I've also had to work through why doesn't don't don't people listen to me? Because can you, can you see the expectation that people listen to me causes my anger? Once I release that, I've still got the problem left that nobody's listening to me. <laughs> and I've got to look at what inside of my soul causes nobody to listen to me automatically. Does that make sense? And that's all about worth. That's all about you know, how I feel about myself. If I felt better about myself, nobody who comes to my property would actually be able to be influenced by spirits in order to not listen to what I'm saying, particularly when it's a request about my own property. Does that make sense? So, so we've got, when we've got... Like when we've got anger, we've got to look at two, we've got to often look at a number of things, not just what it's it's often the, the anger is the result of expectation, hence the tantrum. But underneath that, there is also another problem. So one problem is the expectation, and that's unloving. The expectation is always unloving. Because when you when you're in a state of love, you don't have any expectations of anyone else ever. At all. Like you don't even expect that your husband will be faithful and you don't even expect you don't expect anything like that. And you don't get angry when they're not. Because all the, because all of your expectations have gone. But that doesn't mean that if you're not attracting people to listen to you, that there isn't an underlying problem. But that's more about self worth. That's more about feeling the grief of self worth. The majority of us don't want to feel that grief. And so we revert to blaming the other person and having and holding on to the expectation. It's sort of like saying this. I feel bad about myself, but I don't want to feel it. So when you treat me bad, I want to tell you that you're bad for treating me bad because I don't want to feel the results of what I feel like when I get treated bad. So what I do is I expect that you treat me well. My expectation means that whenever you don't treat me well, I'm going to get angry. That make sense? So there's two problems. One problem is my expectation. The second problem is my worth. When I deal with my expectation, I'll no longer get angry with you, but I still have the problem of not getting treated well. 
that's my worth that has to be addressed. And that's the emotion I'm probably not addressing because it's too painful. Hence, I my desire to feel powerful by getting angry. Does everyone follow me there? Yeah. I follow you, but <laughs> <coughs> I feel the danger here is that everyone goes, Jesus analyzes two issues and then he deals with expectation and he finds and he does all this intellectually but I don't. and that's not what he does no. so he does it all emotionally mm. and the, the our desire to engage the intellect is all about avoiding that process emotionally so that do you mind me just saying that no because no the, i just know i live with you and i know because i've tried it intellectually none of that you yeah, but let, let's. Uh, I think I need to give more information, perhaps, yeah. because um, there's a, there is a danger even with that statement that everything will be confused. <laughs> when somebody does something towards me that is unloving, if I have cleared away all of my own expectations on that subject, I won't get angry. Ever. If I have expectations on the subject... I allow myself to feel the anger and then my anger, I find the fear that the anger is covering by allowing myself to feel the anger. I find the addiction. The addiction is, oh, I want people to, in this case that I was giving an example, to listen to me when they're on my own property. I don't care if they, listen to, if they don't listen to me at all when I'm on theirs, but when they're on mine and I'm talking about what I want done on my property and they say they're there to help and I'm paying them to, to do that, give me help then they need to listen to me. That's what I expect. That expectation is unloving. I allow myself to feel the expectation. I go, ah. And, you know, the first way I allow myself to feel it is go out and bash with the baseball bat for 10 or 15 minutes and allow myself to feel it. <laughs> How much I want them to, you know, listen, listen to what I've got to say, particularly when they're on my property. Then... In the process of bashing, I feel what the addiction is. The addiction is all about me just wanting someone, wanting to be listened to and people to do what I'm asking, particularly when I'm paying them. I feel it's a lack of honour and a lack of respect and all these other things and I allow myself to feel that. There's my fear. My fear is actually that nobody feels that and that I'll never have that. And then I'm starting to get close to the real cause of my anger, which is the grief associated with the fact that nobody really cares about me. Why do I feel that nobody really cares about me? Because I have issues of self-worth. Does that make sense? Like, in the end, you get there, but, but only by feeling each layer as you go down. But don't think that when you're experiencing your anger only as the emotion that you're actually getting to the bottom of the real problem. Because the real problem, the real problem with anger is that you are outwardly expressing something that's not related to what you think it's related to. So, so in, the, in my example, when I'm angry with the people who come on the property who don't listen, right? it's because I have an expectation that they listen. Once I release the expectation that they listen, they still might not listen. But I'll have released the expectation and those, so therefore no longer get angry. But that doesn't mean that the second problem, which is the bigger issue of self-worth, which is the real reason why no one listens to me, has been addressed. Once I actually work through my feelings about the lack of self-worth that I have, then people automatically listen to me without me having to ask them. Does that make sense? Then I can actually say, oh, I would like to do this, and the next day it's done. <laughs> Whereas before I had to write a five-page list, dot-pointed, and, and instructions, and they still didn't do it. <laughs> Does that make sense? Once I work through the emotion, the attraction is different. So I've got two problems whenever I've got anger. I've got anger, which is indicating the, exp the ad addiction to getting what I want, and that is all about my expectations and demands. And then I've got the secondary problem, which is what the anger is covering over. All the things that I'm getting away with by having the anger. That's the secondary issue. And that's the bigger issue. 
that's the stuff we really want to get to at the end. That'll create the change in the law of attraction. Correct. Without that, our law of attraction won't change even if we get rid of our anger. But the reality is you can get rid of your anger and not deal with the actual event either. So you can get rid of your anger about being treated badly and still not actually deal with why you be treated badly. And if you really want to deal with being treated badly, you're going to have to do both things. You're going to have to release the anger, which is all about your expectations and addictions. That's all your unloving behaviour. Your anger is your unloving behaviour. Does it make sense? The underlying emotion is usually being caused by others' unloving behaviour towards you. In other words, your childhood mm. causal emotion. Mm. So if I'm getting angry about not getting listened to, there's my unloving behaviour. Not, not, not the people who have not listened to me. That, that's immaterial. Like, I can't change that. I'm getting angry with them. That's my unloving behaviour. I need to see that's my unloving behaviour. That's because of my expectation that my addictions get met. Right? So that's one thing that I'm going to have to go through. And then underneath that is the real reason why nobody listens to me, which is my own feelings of lack of self-worth. Once I work through my own feelings of lack of self-worth, which will be related to how I was treated unlovingly as a childhood, now other people will treat me lovingly without me even having to ask them. They'll just automatically want to treat me lovingly. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yep. And we need to see the two states as different to each other. You see, many of us go into anger, but we don't understand that it's our unloving behaviour. We're not owning that it's our unloving behaviour. Feel it. Work your way through the expectation. Feel the expectation. Feel the addiction. Feel the fear that it covers over. Feel how much you desperately want them to do what you want. But understand underneath all of that is the real feeling, and that is the grief associated with the fact that as a child you didn't get what you wanted. You didn't get listened to. You didn't get whatever it was. That also needs to be felt at some point. Yep. What I see most people doing is they go, work through their anger. They think they've worked through the anger. <coughs> you know, they have a big spit and they go out and punch the bag, bang, 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 you know, for half an hour, half an hour, two hours, three hours, four days, ten days, two weeks, five weeks, ten weeks. Three months later, they're still doing it about the same problem. Why? Because the same expectation exists within them that existed three months earlier. And it's the expectation that's unloving that they're unwilling to address. The anger is just coming up over and over and over and over and over again because they don't want to submit to the fear that they actually have that's creating the addiction that causes their anger. All right? And this is why a person can bash and bash and bash and bash for months on end and still at the end of those months or the end of the years still feel the same as when they started because they don't want to get to what's underneath the anger, the fear that's triggering the anger. Once you release or get to the fear that's triggering the anger, you will no longer be able to get angry anymore about that situation. That doesn't mean you've cured the actual problem. It just means you've cured this tantrum process, which is a problem in itself. The majority of us revert to that. That is a big problem that the majority of us face. If if you knew how long the average person who passes over from earth to the spirit world stays in a tantrum, you'd be shocked. Right? Because the average person who pa passes from this world into the spirit world stays in a tantrum for nearly 100 years. That's on average. There are many that are in tantrums for 2,000 years or longer. Right? So a tantrum can be maintained for a long period of time. Yeah. Now, you don't want to do that. You're not going to progress like that. So you need to understand that tantrums are all about your fears. And unless you're willing to get to your fear, you'll always revert to the tantrum. Because tant tantrum feels powerful. That's the only reason why you revert to it, because it feels powerful. It's a great way of covering over emotion. Right? So, so don't do that all the time. So start looking at your tantrums and seeing them for what they are. 
understand there's a fear underneath them. When you release, the physically, emotionally release the expectation that drives your tantrum, you will no longer have a tantrum about that thing anymore. So somebody will be able to treat you the same way as before and even though you haven't gotten rid of the attraction, the fact that you've atta attracted somebody treating you that way, you will have gotten rid of your response to it, which is your rage and anger in expectation that they do something different. Does that make sense? Yeah. When you deal with that, now you are open to actually dealing with the real cause. So I'm finding now that while I don't have huge anger responses to a lot of things, what happens is I have quite a lot of work yet to do with regard to the issue of self-worth. Does that make sense? So I still attract events that if I had released certain things from my soul, I would no longer attract. But it's rare for me to get into the rages that I see other people getting into and living in for years on end. When I'm in a rage, it usually lasts probably, I don't know, about the longest is a couple of hours, isn't it? I've never seen it that long. <laughs> <laughs> you know? It's very rare for me to be in a rage for more than one day, like to be angry for longer than a day. I, I can't remember a time when I've been angry for longer than a day um, about a certain subject. Does that make sense? Ever? No. Ever. Because I see the rage as I allow myself to feel it, but I always allow myself to get to what the fear is that's driving it. If you do that, you can't repeat it. Does that make sense? So if I, if I get angry with Mary for something Mary's done, or you know, let's say, and you know, in our first parts of our relationship, sometimes Mary would project at other men sexually or something like that, and I'd feel angry about that, right? If I get to my fear... If I, if I allow myself to feel the anger, bash something, feel the, get to my fear, which is, oh, Mary doesn't want me. There's my fear. Now I'm feeling my fear. It's very highly unlikely I'll get angry about, about it anymore. Does that make sense? Because now I'm feeling my fear that I'm not wanted. Does that make sense? And because I'm feeling my fear, the tantrum can't happen. The tantrum only happens because you're unwilling to feel the fear. Right? So, so let's say Mary, um, let's say Mary starts speaking with me, and I'm distracted and I'm doing something else, and Mary feels like I'm not listening to her. If in that moment Mary allowed herself to feel her fear, there would be very little anger. Does that make sense? Because the fear is, I'm never going to be listened to. And there's a fear un underneath that, isn't there, of if I'm not listened to, I'm not loved. Right? And if you allow yourself to feel that fear, then you won't get revert to it. So Mary wouldn't be yelling and screaming at me because of me not listening to her, because she'd already be feeling her fear. <coughs> so that's what we need to understand about anger as well, this tantrum process. And that's very, very different to feeling some of the anger that you're going to need that's very childlike in its nature, that you weren't allowed to express when you were a child. So you know, the things that you were told or things that were unfair that happened when you were in your childhood that you weren't allowed to address, that particular anger is often very quick and very easy to feel once you get there and usually very rapidly into some kind of sadness afterwards. Usually within 30 seconds to a minute into some kind of sadness. But the anger that goes on longer than that is generally a tantrum of some kind, an expectation that you have that something be satisfied and it's not satisfied. So the key is understanding your anger. Thanks so much for being so patient. Mm. So many times. That's all right. But it, I feel it's important to understand all of these emotions, right? Because 
if you don't understand where they're coming from, you're going to take a tangent that often is not very helpful. So I've seen many people say, and we, we have some friends up our way who have said, AJ's told us to feel our anger. So you know what they do when they feel their anger? They go yelling and screaming at everybody and like, now, is that what I've said, really? No, not really. But that's their justification of their tantrum. They're unwilling to get to what they expect. They don't want to see what they expect. I once said to somebody, it's only your expectations that create most of your rage. And once all of your expectations of others have gone, you won't have any rage left. Because yeah. you'll be in your fear and your sadness by then. Yeah. And we often have these huge expectations of others, don't we? If you think about it, you have expectations of your partner, you have expectations of your children, you have expectations of your workmates, and you have expectations of God. You have expectations of yourself, where you get really upset and angry with yourself. And all of it's just a tantrum, avoiding a fear. And if we can see it as that, we'll get to the underlying fear rapidly, rather than living in the tantrum for long periods of time. Yeah. We see a lot of people living in tantrums for long periods of time, don't we, babe? Yeah. yeah. And it's hard during that phase too, because what happens is you start, you sort of start getting disillusioned with the process when you're like that, because you know it's still there, you know the anger is still there, and it feels like nothing's changing, and when you feel like nothing's changing. It's great to be honest about it, that nothing is changing. But when you feel like nothing's changing, you think, oh, well, I might as well give up then because it's not working. Not understanding that it's not working because we're not willing to give up our, our addictions. We're not willing to give up our expectations and our demands that are unloving. If you took away from people on earth meat, just one thing, meat, I reckon you'd have about six billion people angry. <laughs> and the only reason why they'd be angry is because they have an expectation that they should be able to eat meat. <laughs> yeah. It's one way to make the whole world angry. <laughs> Not that I'd recommend that, but... But it's interesting, isn't it, how expectation causes us to react. In relationships, it's really dominant. We have so many expectations of our partner or potential partner. And, and this is a primary cause of a lot of our problems in a relationship. We have expectations of our partner that we don't even have of ourselves towards our partner. So, for example, the average woman on the planet has an expectation that the partner, the man, in, this, in the example I give, provides all of her financial security, right? And in return, she'll provide him with sexual security or with, you know, meals and other things. And then he gets the feeling he's got to have sexual security from his wife as long as he provides the financial security. Now we've got what's called a great relationship. And it's not a great relationship, it's just two people in complete codependence with their expectations. And one of them take away the expectation. So for them, let's say the man gets sacked at work and now he's on the dole. Or in another country he has no income at all. What does she do then? Now she feels angry. She feels unloved and uncared for and all of her security issues are starting to come up. So she then starts looking at other men. And what does he feel then? He feels you slut, you've done, you know, you're off going off trying to find somebody else. He feels all this rage and anger because all of his expectations now are coming up. And both of them would not have those emotions if they had no expectations. It's only the expectations that causes that rage. It 
it was interesting when I gave the talk of about anger is your guide. I gave it in 2009, I think. Is that right, Jess? Yeah, something like that. And it was one of the most poorly attended uh, seminars we've had, as you can imagine. Second only to parenting. Second only to parenting. <laughs> and, uh, and almost everybody in the audience was in complete denial that they had any anger at all. Which meant that it was like talking to a room of zombies <laughs> who would not engage the entire conversation in any way. And this is because most of us don't want to know even about our anger. Like We don't want to know that we use it as a tool. We use it as a tool. We like using it as a tool to feel powerful. We don't want to see it as such. We don't feel good doing it when we're in the process of doing it. But, but it makes us feel better than if we had to feel the fear. And so we go for it. That's the problem. Yeah. It's a challenge to get through that state. And you're going to need to have a really strong desire to get through that state. To, to work your way through the expectations and addictions. But understand that once you work through the expectations and addictions, it does not mean that you'll attract something different because your attraction is based about your grief. Can you see? That? And that's your causal emotion that causes the soul-based attractions. But you will have to work through your anger and your rage and your expectations and addictions to even get to your grief. Because you won't be able to do it without getting through your anger and your rage. You won't be able to get to the grief while you justify yourself getting angry in return and having expectations in return all the time. You won't get to your grief that way. You can only get to your grief by allowing yourself to see the anger and expectations are unloving. And once you've worked your way through that process, you will no longer be angry. And then you'll be open enough to actually find your grief. Yeah. So everyone's a bit yeah. depressed about that. <laughs> Bummer, huh? Bummer, hey. <laughs> yeah. So it, can I ask you a few questions yourself as an audience? Like, do you find, do you, can you see from that discussion how many of your angers are really just tantrums? You see that? Yeah. And where do you notice they are in particular? Eloisa, you wanna just if you just grab the mic, where is the mic at the moment? Yeah. You mean where the tantrums are? Yeah. My tantrums around the kids not doing what I want. Okay, so a lot about children where yeah. you're sort of having a tantrum and they don't do exactly what you want them to do. Yep. Yep. Oh good. and and sometimes And sometimes Pete. Pete but a bit less, less Pete at the moment. More the children. Yeah. Yeah. Because Pete does more of what you want. Um, yeah, like I'd say, yeah, but yeah. not so much. Oh, he's kind of challenging that now. Yeah. But I think that I can see my part in it more. So yep. I might still rise, but I'm like, hold on. It's still intellectual, but it's like, oh, yeah, I'm the one out of line here. So I'll go to the car. So you're finding it harder to recognise with the children? Yeah. Yep. Like, and like, I know you've said it heaps of times before, but I've only kind of, well, I probably still haven't got it, but the fears, you know, and I'm just thinking, what am I so afraid of? Like, I'll get, horrend I'll get horrendous, you know. I'm pretty yeah. ashamed of that. Can, <laughs> can I ask a, a, another question of, the, of most of the people in the audience who have had children? How many of you have had children? So the majority. Um, how many of you have realised that you had children for yourself and not for the child? How many of you have realised that, that a lot of times it was about you and what you wanted? Yeah. It's a common problem, isn't it? Just how much we want something and we think a child is going to fulfil something that often the child doesn't end up fulfilling at all. <laughs> and we have a lot of expectations about that. And that's why we have a lot of anger often with our children. Yeah. It just feels bad now, though. Like, you know it's bad. 
Yeah. Oh, it feels bad. I but still want to do it, though. But another reason why we have a lot of anger with our children is because we do allow our children to get away with murder, as the yeah. saying goes. <laughs> And we've got to look at why we do that. We have big investments emotionally in that. Do you know what those investments would be? What do you get out of giving all this stuff to your children? Like, what do you well, get I get to of? avoid a lot of stuff. Like I, get, I feel like if I give it all to them, then I can... Um, that they're going to love me or that I'm being a great mum or that people okay. are going to say how wonderful I am and you're so good with your kids. And exactly. That's what I want anyway. Yeah, okay. Know? So those addictions are the present, which covers a lot of fear, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. because I don't feel like a very good mum. Yeah, yeah. That's good. Yep. Any other things that you feel like where you notice there's a general pattern of sort of expectations and demands? In in day to day life, like uh, Laura, um, probably a little bit less dos in the past week, but always a huge tantrum of not being loved, and more so from like my mum. I like I've just wanted her. Like I know I'm in addiction. I know I. Just, but it's like I want this one woman to love me more than I want God to love me. Yeah, you know, and I recognise it. It's like, God, you're great, but she's my mum. Like, I want her, you know. It's like God created your soul, but she's not your mum. <laughs> yeah, and that's when it got a little bit like, whoa, it kind of hit me in the face of yeah. I'm wanting mum more than, than God. It's often the people who have not given us things that we want the most from. Mm -hmm. Have you noticed that? Yeah. So, you know, if, it's, if, if you look at your parents, the parent who did not give you if, the, if a parent did not give you something, then you want more from that parent, generally. You're always seeking their approval, trying harder with them, all those kind of things. Yep. Is there any other patterns that you have noticed? If we have mic over. <clears throat> I find that my tantrums are about I always have the same saying that comes up lately. Oh, that's right, I'm allowed to have nothing. You're allowed to have nothing. Nothing. And so I just... I'm not going into full-blown tantrums anymore because I, I can see what the deal is. But yeah. that's what's... So when you say you're allowed me. to have nothing, that was the after effect. What do you feel during the tantrum? That you have nothing and you shouldn't have? Or? No, that's the whole tantrum. Is, uh, oh, that's right, I'm not allowed to have anything. You're not allowed to have anything. Right. But the yeah. feeling is... You want that, something. That, that's not fair. I should that's be able right. to. That's right. That's yes. right. Yeah. Oh, that's right. Nothing. Yeah. 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 So, so it's a feeling driven by injust, a feeling of injustice. How many of you feel anger is justified when injustice has occurred? <laughs> the majority of us, right? Yeah. You see, that's an expectation too. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny, we don't see that our soul created the injustice because it's, it's something to do within the pain of our soul that creates the injustice generally. Mm -hmm. So when we go to the anger, we're basically avoiding the pain in our soul that created the injustice in the first place. Yeah. Rachel? Uh, just behind a bit. Um. I was really relating to all of that, but I've got this thing with God at the moment and I'm recognising myself in that about injustice and it's all mixed up, but the big thing is how... And I'm, I know I'm trying to work it out intellectually and as I'm going through this, I can feel it more emotionally, but I still want to ask the question. Yeah, yeah, that's <laughs> fine, that's fine. Far away. Um, and it's about how can God... It, I have this sense of injustice towards the system that God's created because like innocent children come to a world where it's impossible for them not to have any injury and I wonder about that I'm I, you know and this is affecting my relationship with God because I'm not happy you know about yep. that yep. and I wonder firstly can I say two things firstly everything that we blame on the world is something about something personally that we're in denial of Do I say that one again? It started to occur to me when you were talking before. <laughs> so, 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 if I'm, so if I'm upset about an injustice of other people, like 
people, like children can't come into a good world. That's a very generalised injustice. The reason why I'm angry about it is because I didn't come into a good world. I, I kind if you of, hold the mic toward, sorry, towards you. I it. kind of feel the opposite. I felt like I arrived in heaven, you know, but then it was taken away and yeah. I have a very strong sense of... It'll be stolen from you. Yeah, and I can't get back there, you know, yeah. that sort of thing. Or I mean, Now, did God do the stealing? No. Who did the stealing? I, I feel like I... Moved towards, you know. Yeah, see, you are very <laughs> unwilling to admit who did the stealing. Who stole your heaven from you? My parents. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose. You suppose. <laughs> the uh, environment that you incarnated into stole yeah. from you, did yeah, it not? Yeah, that's how I feel. But you're unwilling to, to go there. Emotionally, there's a deep unwillingness inside of you to place the blame where it actually lies. Mm. And because of that, you wish to blame God instead. And this is the second thing we need to understand about blame or rage with God, is that we are frequently blaming God because we're, we feel unable to cope with the emotions of who is, to really, who is really to blame. Yeah. And I keep on, I get to that point, then I go back into relationship with my parents in a way that's similar to how I was before, and then I feel this total disillusionment. Like, rather, and I don't know how to get to the next step in a way of, you know, with, whilst yep. being loving towards them and, and being in relationship or not, or all that kind of stuff. I, I understand, feel. yeah. This is a conundrum for many people, isn't it? Like, mm. And so what we do then is we revert back to blaming God for the system. Yeah. Because we don't want to blame the actual people who caused the damage. Mm. Does that make sense? Yeah. So if you can understand that the reason why you're blaming God for the system is because you don't want to blame the persons who actually caused your personal damage. Does everyone get that? We, we, we basically, what we're doing is we're substituting our God for our parents in that process. What we're basically saying is that our parents weren't, aren't to blame, but God is. But God didn't create the system as it is. God created a perfect system with perfect people on it, and it was the people's choices that led to this system. So, so when we blame God rather than blaming what really has, has occurred, or, and if we're going to blame anything at all, that is, we're doing it because we get to avoid emotions that way. And the emotions you get to avoid is you get to avoid the pain and suffering as a result of the, of the broken relationship with your parents. But you also get to avoid the pain and suffering of how you felt about that by placing the blame on God and saying it was all God's fault in the first place. You know? And this is where you've got to be careful that you identify the cause of the tantrum. Your true cause of your tantrums, Rachel, are about not wanting to see the truth about your parents. So the real question, the real, do you have a fear associated with that? Does that make sense? So what the fear is that if you see the truth associated with your parents, you're not going to want to spend any time with them at all. And you're not even going to want them as parents anymore. And that's, you're afraid of that for lots of reasons. Some of it's to do with judgment of society. Some of it's to do with self-judgment. Some of it's to do with what the parents will do to you then. And, and one of the biggest reasons is because you know that if you finish up placing the blame where it actually lies, your parents are never going to give you what you want. And you still want them to. So, so you're better off blaming someone else who, who is not involved than you are blaming or, or pl placing or attributing responsibility for what happened to the people who did it. And, and this is an avoidance of a lot of terror, of a lot of fear in relationships. And this is why you, get, you feel stuck, right, with your parents. It's like you go away, you think, oh, yeah, I've got issues with my parents, I've got these problems with my parents. And so what you do is you stay away from them to refer to And then you feel, oh, no, that's not good. And you also have the addiction, which is I want those parents to love me. 
And so you go back and gauge the relationship again, but then it turns out just to be as dissatisfying as it was before, and so you go away again, but then you go back again. And the reason why we cycle back and forward in the same situation all the time is because we are will, unwilling to take the next step required. And, and if you can understand that with every single thing that you're stagnant with, the reason why we're stagnant on the particular issue, whatever the issue is, is because we're unwilling to take the next step that's required. When you take the next step that's required, which is a personal acknowledgement of who did create the pain inside of you, emotional, personal acknowledgement of that, then you will know what to do with your parents. You will feel what to do with your parents in that place. And you will do it because you want to. Does that make sense? But until that point is realised, you'll go back and forth in this stagnant place, seesawing between not having much contact with them, having some contact and feeling dissatisfied, having not much contact, going back and forward. For, because we go back and forth because we don't want to take the next step. And that's what I realise whenever I'm stagnant, is I don't want to take the next step. Yep. I acknowledge it. Pray about it. Say to God, look, I, I understand now what's going on. I don't want to take the next step. I don't want to take the step. Can you show me what I need to do in order to take the next step? And sometimes it's just humility you know, that we need to pray for. Let me be humble. I know what the next step I need to take is. Let me be humble enough to take it, come what may. Whatever happens. Yeah. Thank you. I had another question. Fire. It's a personal question sure. for both of you. And yep. I'm a bit scared about asking this, actually, but <laughs> go for it. We'll bite your head off, I'm yeah. sure. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I've been wondering... <laughs> Um, you mentioned a few times in previous talks that you have not been sharing, you've not been sleeping together, mm -hmm. whatever. And I was wondering if you were willing to share the emotional reasons why that. So I certainly. Um, if Mary's yeah. okay with that, yeah. You want to share some? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um. Well, we have been sleeping together now. I'm just trying to remember exactly what was going on then, because now there's other things going on. So, you know, it's never a static, oh, that's all finished now, we're happy. Um, <laughs> um, you probably have much... What happened when we decided to sleep apart was that we both realised, and AJ really brought it to my attention, but... It was something that was nagging and simmering within me for a long time and I knew that we had an issue, but I didn't really want to face it. And that was that I was using sex as a way to get some of my addictions met, to feel in control, to feel loved, to feel wanted, but I was not giving any of those... I was not giving control or I was not surrendering emotionally, I wasn't giving any love. And I wasn't giving any time or affection, really, to AJ in a sincere way. And we both realised that was not very loving at all and that I needed to deal with the reasons why that was the case. And, I, and I probably felt, I felt that I was just feeding Mary's addiction to have some, um, what would you call, feelings of being attractive and and uh, being loved and everything from myself, while at the same time she was using it to get away emotionally from a lot of the emotions she needed to address. So The truth is I feel I have a lot of sexual terror still inside of me that I don't want to address. Um, but even more than that, I don't feel very attractive or wanted, even though I am with someone who finds me very attractive and does want me. There are wounds inside of me that I haven't grieved and because of that, 
I, my heart is not open to even receive those feelings and my heart is certainly not open to giving them. That is something that I feel that I'm challenging more now, mm. much more. Um, so we slept apart for nearly six months mm -hmm. just recently. Um, Which it doesn't need to be that long, but that's how much resistance I have to this issue. Um, and the main reason why I felt was that to sleep together would have been unethical because there were certain things Mary was demanding of myself that she was unprepared to give me. Does that make sense? Yeah. And I could see, you know, once we had this big discussion about this, I could see that, you know, it was a really harmful thing that I was wanting to maintain and I felt then I can't do this anymore. Um, it, I was fostering, I was living in an addiction. Uh, it was helping me avoid things. The only time I felt any type of good at any time was when AJ was giving me a lot of attention and I needed to deal with that in a more sincere way. Um, and I still need to deal with those emotions. Like, I'm not... Yeah, recently it sort of changed a bit now to... Mary has a willingness to see the ethics of, of our relationship but there is still a lot of rage that she has regarding feeling unwanted and unloved relating to her first century life that she needs to address. And I don't feel any, uneth any ethical problem um, being with her while she's having a desire to work her way through those emotions. But as soon as she no longer has a desire to work through those emotions, then I don't feel that we can engage sexually or emotionally very much until she has that desire again. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. yep. Essentially, our sexual relationship, and I think it's the same for any relationship that is like romantic and sexual, our sex life reflects our emotional life. Like, um, so a lot of people connect well sexually because one person has control and the other one is willing to be submissive because they're getting something from that. And I don't mean in some kind of sadomasochistic way. I mean just generally some people are much more comfortable to give their partner total control and they connect. But invariably you find that in the, the rest of the relationship it's usually the same thing going on emotionally. One person has control, the other one allows that. And that's how their codependence matches and that's why they have an attraction. So, the, so if I can maybe explain more of what Mary's just said there, it's like when we have a love-based relationship, usually what you see happening in most relationships is one person is the giver in the relationship, where one person's given their heart, given themselves emotionally, and so forth, and the other person has taken all of that but hasn't opened up themselves. And usually you find either one of four different problems. And the four, If you look at any transaction that goes on between two people, there's Mary needs to learn how to receive love and Mary needs to learn how to give love and I need to learn how to receive love and I need to learn how to give love. Now, you can see from those four particular things that if one of us has not learnt one of those things, that there is going to be an impact on the relationship. So, so if I haven't learnt how to give love, but I know how to receive love, and Mary's learnt how to give and receive love, I'm not giving her any love, and so she's going to feel like there's none coming to her. Does it make sense? And so for that reason, there is going to be a problem. And I'm also being unethical. I'm expecting her to give me love and I'm happy to receive it but I'm not happy to give love in return. Mm -hmm. So so there's an unethic there's an issue of ethics, a lack of ethics as well in the relationship. So it only requires one of those four things to be broken before a lack of ethics develops in the relationship. Now, in the normal relationship what we notice most people do is they allow that to continue generally ad infinitum, you know, all of their life on earth. They allow the unethical position to continue but we don't because we feel that you can't grow towards God doing that, but also you can't be closer yeah. in the relationship when you do that. 
And so whenever we notice an unethical position rise in the relationship where one or the other is not wanting to heal one of those two issues that each of us need to concentrate in, and so I'll just say them again because it's important to understand them. One is Mary needs to learn how to give love and Mary needs to learn how to receive love and I need to learn how to give love and I need to learn how to receive love. So, so if one of those four things are a problem, we now have an unethical situation in the relationship. And, and, an, and if the person who has that particular problem is unwilling to address that issue immediately, then you've got to question why you would stay in the sexual relationship immediately. Not, not, not wait for six months or a year or ten years or wait until the children are 18 or whatever before you address the issue. You address the issue as soon as, uh, as it arises. Yep. Does that make sense? Yeah. Perfectly. Thank you yeah. for answering that. Yeah. So, you, if you want to ask anything else, that's okay. Yeah. You know, I feel that it's an issue for a lot of people, and especially a lot of women that I know. You know, I feel there's all this stuff that we ride along with. We don't want to confront. It brings up fear and feelings of shame and unworthiness and all this kind of stuff. And um, but it it. It only ends up bringing pain, just sitting on it, you know, and that's really what's happened for us uh, and, yeah, for both of us, just mm. created a lot of pain. I was, I still struggle to receive love properly. I'll receive attention, but to receive love is very challenging and to give it. Mm. And so AJ was in a situation where he was giving a lot of love, not having even the feeling that it was being received properly. He wasn't receiving any love. And I was just trying to avoid the whole shambles by just feeling a little bit okay for a little bit of time. So know. that was probably the biggest issue that I could feel in Mary, a deep desire to not address the issue. Yeah. So we discussed it many times prior and uh, I still felt that Mary had a deep desire to not address the issue. And I just said, well, if you're not going to address the issue, then we don't really have a relationship and I want to live like we don't have one. Mm. <laughs> until such a time, point in time that you're willing to, to address some of these issues. From my own perspective, though, there are, there are issues that men under, the, under these circumstances would have to also address. See, most men are sexually driven, and as a result, uh, for a man to consider not sleeping with his wife for six months while she's addressing a certain issue and giving her the time to do that, most men on the planet wouldn't do that. Um, most men would just get upset with their wife and maybe go off with somebody else or at least look at porn or some other thing in order to have some of their addictions fulfilled. And from my perspective, the thing that uh, I, you know, I had to address in the past to be able to do that is, is to actually feel like, no, my heart's Mary's, I, like I, I want Mary, but I don't, I don't want to force Mary to want me. I don't want to force her to love me. I don't want to force her to receive my love either. And so I've got to be prepared to um, allow myself to feel what I feel, I feel my love for her and feel that I would desire her love, while at the same time not having my love for her uh, reciprocated in any way, nor being received by Mary. And, and also working, allowing myself to stay in that situation and feel whatever I feel about that situation without reverting to some other kind of form of addiction in order to make that sadness go away. So, so um, for me, I probably dealt with a lot of that before I met Mary, um, but some of it since. Um, I've had to deal with some of those emotions since to get to the stage where I'm quite happy to live my life for six months without having sex with Mary, um, in the sense of happy, when, you, when I say happy is probably not the right term. It's, well, I'm content to do that. It doesn't... I, I don't feel angry about that or anything like uh, so during that period like uh, I'd give Mary a kiss and a cuddle good night and walk off to the tent you know like but but not feel angry with Mary that 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 it's in the position however when the situation keeps going on for a long period of time like 6 months like that I I was quite firm with Mary about why she was wanting it to go that long and what's really going on, and if it's going to go much longer, that she needed to consider leaving me if it was going to go much longer. 
because really um, it's not fair on the other person from an ethical perspective to stay in a relationship with the person while at the same time um, not addressing the emotional issues. Does that make sense? So, so I believe quite strongly that if two people are committed to dealing with their relationship issues, they will not put off issues for long periods of time. There may be times when you sleep apart or whatever, but you will not put it off. You won't, you won't go, oh, I'm perfectly content with doing this. You, you will want to address the issue. And what I notice happening a lot is people uh, do not really want to deal with the issue, but they want all the results of the relationship still. So, so for many women, they want the security and safety of being in the relationship, but they don't want to address their sexual issues. For many men, they want their women to address the sexual issues and they're willing to provide security and safety and, and, until the woman is obvious the woman doesn't want to deal with her sexual issues and then he, they go off and have someone else instead. You know, and so that both things are unloving actions. Or I, um, I notice some men that we know want women to deal with their sexual issues. They can see that... And the woman oftentimes is acknowledging that they have them, but they still want the woman to provide other things to them, like um, looking after them physically, looking Bas after basically the kids, doing mummying the cleaning, them, you know? cooking, <laughs> mothering them. Mothering them, And right. they're not willing to look at those issues. And yeah. that's, again, unethical. Yeah. So we see many men wanting a mother rather than a, a partner. You know, and they want a mother, but, and I know this sounds a bit you know, like incestuous, but they want a mother with sex. Basically, that's what they want. They want a mother, just a younger version of their mother, you know, like a 30-year younger version <laughs> of their mother who will give them sex, as well as do all of the other things that mummy used to do for them, such as clean up after them, wash, wash up after them, wash their clothes, iron their clothes, do their dishes, you know, all those kind of things, make them feel like they're a nice guy and all those kind of things. And... And uh, there's a lot of the guy's addictions, you know, in play. And, and honestly, he needs to deal with that just as much as she would need to deal with her, re her, her desire to do that without giving her heart sexually or emotionally. So, so e either problem is a problem. Like I said, there's the four transactions that are occurring in the relationship... And any time one of those four transactions is not occurring, we have a problem in the relationship. Yep. Ironically, most of us have a problem in our relationships pretty permanently mm -hmm. because one of those four things is not happening most of the time. And the key is to work our way through the issues, to have a desire to work our way through the issues. One of the, in the, we've just recently done a series of FAQs about human relationships. We're talking primarily about sexual relationship with a partner. And I think we've done 14 questions so far, I think six and eight so far. But one of the very first questions that we ask, we call it one of the primary questions is, it's the second primary question, do I want to love? <laughs> we find that a lot of people don't want to love the way God loves. They don't want to love in a pure way. They, they, want, they don't want to refine their love in the relationship. They just want their addictions met. Yeah. And your relationship can't grow like that. It can't. So we're willing to confront those things as they occur in the relationship. And if that means sleeping apart for a period of time, then we do as a result. We don't expect that will continue for much longer. Um, if we're both willing to address the emotional issues, then it's highly unlikely it will continue. And if we're both unwilling or one of us is unwilling to address the emotional issues then at the end the relationship should terminate mm -hmm. because, because, because one doesn't have a sincere desire to change. Um, and that's in material what the other person feels. Like if the other person wants to be in the relationship but, the other, but one person is unwilling ethically to, to address the issues in the relationship, then the relationship should really terminate until such a time as that both parties feel the same desire to address the issues in the relationship. Mm. Yeah. But you've got to be careful because you can frequently use it as an excuse. You can frequently go, this pain is so big, I don't want to deal with it, and so not having a relationship is better for me. <laughs> <laughs> you feel that one? Oh, yeah, that's, that's where I'm at. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, 
Like, do I really have to go into another relationship? <laughs> exactly, <Yeah. laughs> exactly. And, and to be honest, if you're going to do that, you're never going to be in a, a one condition with God ever. And you are also never going to be truly happy yourself. I really if you hold want the mic to, more towards sorry, I really want a relationship. I mean, I've just come out of a relationship. Oh, well, okay. I, I don't know. Right. <laughs> I don't you know just said to, earlier you didn't. Yeah, well, okay. I don't know how to love. I really know that. I feel like... Ah, uh, be very careful. This okay. is something that Mary has said to me frequently and I've said to her, no, that is not true. Okay. When you say you don't know how to love, really what you're saying is you don't want to have to love. Okay. And you need to look at why. It's an anger-based position. Yeah. 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 And it involve, it's taken because we don't want to face the Certain fear emotion. and the pain that's already in, in us. And in this uh, set of questions that we just recently recorded, AJ talks a little bit about what he had to do or what he did, what you wanted to do before you even met me. Mm. So while you were single, you really went back over past relationships emotionally and dealt with a lot of stuff mm. and I'm sure that's why he attracted me into his life because I, I wasn't probably going to be doing <laughs> I don't I think Mary was going to attract me. stuff yeah. before I met him yeah. but um yeah so you can deal you don't have to like be in a relationship to deal with that yeah. pain because that's kind of where I'm at. I feel like... No, I don't believe no? that's where you're at, Rachel. Sorry. <laughs> I'm not going to let you off the hook with this right. one. Right. Where you're at, actually, is you have this underlying... There's the underlying justification, which is, I don't know how to love, so I shouldn't be in a relationship. That's the underlying justification you currently have. It's not true. The real justification is, I don't want to have to love the way God loves, and so I'd rather not be in a relationship. That's the real position. I might have to feel afraid or vulnerable. I might have to put my heart on the sleeve. They might reject me. It might just all be all these other things that I'm afraid of. So yeah. I don't know how to love. That's where we go. So you've got to be careful that you don't fool yourself into believing one thing because it's easier than believing the real truth about what's going on. So my feeling, like the feeling I can feel in you is quite strong that at this point in time, you don't want to have a relationship, really, because you're afraid of what love's going to involve in terms of your heart. And that needs to be addressed somehow. You need to work your way through that somehow. And that's about releasing old grief about relationships. Does that make sense? There's old grief about relationships that hasn't been released that caused you to have this anger-based justification that you don't know how to love now. And it's not true. You know enough about love to know how to love. It's just that you don't want to do it yet. So be honest about that. And be angry about that if you want to be angry about it. But you'll get to the reasons why you don't want to if you acknowledge the truth. Yeah. Make sense? Thank you so much. No All right. <laughs> <laughs> just got to go to the loo. So sure, come back if, you, if we go straight behind, Dave. Oh. Just wanted to say thanks for today, Jesus and Mary. Um, Pleasure. My question's around shame. Yeah. Um, what I'm, kind of shame? Well, for me, I've realised that I'm basically locked up in lots of different shame. Right, yep. Um, in my Law of Attraction events, generally, like, I'll realise it afterwards. I'm yep. like, hold on, I was actually, like, being feeling shame being triggered in that instance, mm -hmm. but I won't connect to it at that time, like... What do you normally do when it's triggered? Well, perfect example. Um, just when we were in the break and the two kids were going around telling everyone that you were that, I'm, that I'm silly or something silly, like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When it was happening, I'm like, I thought about it. I'm like, well, yeah, I actually am pretty silly with them. Like, that's okay. Yeah. But then when I was feeling about it afterwards, I'm like, I was actually feeling a lot of shame just hearing my name in a group of people being said over and over. Like, ah, yeah. There was yeah. a lot of shame about that, and yeah. You know, and it just seems to be a lot of the time, basically, yeah. just um, shame about myself as a male. Um, yeah. You know that I'm not actually what a real man should be, and that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, a lot of shame around sexual shame, like um, shame that that I like that I find 
a female attractive or I might find a male attractive, like shame about that. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah it's just, you keep on going, really, if you want to know yeah. different shames. So you find different like things about sexual ambiguity as well, like where you're not sure one way or the other with attractions to male and men and women? Um, I'm pretty sure, and I've always been pretty sure about who I'm sexually attracted to, Yeah. but if I, if I found, if I thought that I thought that that guy was, say, good-looking in just a um, non-sexual way, yeah. I'd feel a lot of shame about that. Okay. Like yep. as if there was something to be shameful about to notice that a man is a, a, a handsome man, I guess. Yeah. Yep. But not a, in a sexual way, if you yep. know what I mean. Yep. Um, but yeah, it all. So is that a shame about acknowledging sort of, uh, should we call it beauty over a person that's not beautiful? Or is it more a shame about the fact that it's a male? Just the shame about the male, basically. Right. Yeah. You know, that's, and that kind of sort of ties back into a man shouldn't think that another man's handsome, I guess. Like, <laughs> and you're not really a real man if, if you do that, I guess. There's, right. there's, there's yeah. a lot of projections I received when I was, when I was younger. But okay. the, the and what do you do with your shame, David? What, what, what do you do when you get where your shame triggered? Do you feel angry or do you just feel sad or do you feel like you want to run away? What is it that you choose to do mostly? Run, run away, I think. Um, it was only... Probably a couple of months ago, that was the first time I actually felt shame. Yeah. Um, like, actually felt it, felt it. Before that, I'd spent a lot of my life where I, like, I don't know, I just thought there was something wrong with me that I couldn't feel shame. I was, yeah. I'd got into this numb, sort of shameless state, I you guess. You know, when you were attracted to drugs, yeah. um, did you find that a lot of that was because you were trying to get away from shame? I didn't recognise it then. Mm. I'm sort of looking at it now. Yeah. Um, I think a lot of my actions have been to avoid the shame. Yep. But my thinking at the time was actually to the complete opposite. I thought that I just shame didn't exist in me, kind of thing. Right. So I realised the difference now. But at the time, I just thought I could do anything and not feel anything bad about it. Basically. Right. So so if we look at shame, because it's a good question about shame, right? If we look at shame as a discussion, it's, uh, it's great to cover a number of things about it. So let's do that. And each of you can help with this discussion because you can feel your own feelings of shame about different things and we can, we can come up with the reasons, you know, what we normally revert to when shame comes up. So, so if we look at the feeling of shame, what would you normally do? So this is what I do. To, to avoid the feeling, what, what are some of the techniques that... Uh, so you've, you've, used, you've mentioned some that you've used, so running away is one of them. Now, there's a number of ways we run away, isn't there? We can run away emotionally, which is always going to be running away, but there's also... We can use physical techniques to run away, so drinking heavily, uh, drinking alcohol heavily taking drugs, using those forms of addictions that are all about running away. So this is about addictions such as... Uh, addictions such as alcohol. Seems to be, I've got to learn how to spell one day. I'm not sure about when that's going to happen. How do you spell? <laughs> oh. so let's call it substance abuse. That helps me a lot. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, hiding, um, emotionally or otherwise. I don't know, when I was a kid, I used to, um, whenever I felt either shame or sadness, what I would do is I would, I, would, I would go out and climb a tree and just hide in the tree or something like that for hours. Right? And many of you probably had that technique when you were little. Right? Okay, so running away is one technique. And there's all sorts of things you might do to run away. Right? So what's another technique? Apologise to you. Okay, so, 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 what should we call that? Um, <laughs> chronic pleasing. <laughs> we'll call that the apologist. Yeah, that's right. Is, is that right? Um, you, you're testing all my spelling, and it's no good. 
Um, it was funny, Eng English, English at school was the only subject that I had to try. <laughs> <laughs> Mathematics, I was fine. Sciences, I was fine. English, I always had to study. <laughs> so when you're an apologist, that means like, so w to avoid shame, you'd apologise for yourself before you even begin the interaction. Yeah. Myself and Mary were talking about this yesterday, weren't we, about how oftentimes in Mary's interaction with me, it was funny, um, on the way down here, um, we were just talking about different emotions then. We stopped at Armadale to pick up some fuel, right? And normally when we stop, I would get out, fill up, while I'm filling up the car, I'd clean the window and everything. And this time, though, Mary decided she was going to get out and clean the window. And she started making apologies before she even started cleaning the window, uh, which I pointed out to her at the time. And then she started feeling about why that was happening. And then, and then after she got back in the car, there was a whole heap of apologies about the window. And, and, and all of this is about avoidance of certain fears, right? Avoidance of certain fears, in particular the feeling of potential shame, but also other fears. Yeah? So the other thing I do is self-attack to avoid shame. So self-attack is another... To avoid shame, if we go up to where's the mic now? Uh, yeah, sorry. Yep. Oh, I, I just want to say justify. We justify. What do you mean by? So can we put it in a whole cl a whole category of justify? Just here we go again. Bad day for it today. Justify, minimize. Shift the blame. Do you know what I mean by all of those things? Yeah. So justify, uh, oh, everybody does that. So, and minimises, minimises things like, oh, it wasn't that bad. You know, it's not that bad. And shifting the blame is, oh, you made me do it. <laughs> that kind of stuff, all of those things we have a tendency to do. Yes. Um, if we come down here, thanks. Yeah. Humour. Humour. Very popular Very one. Very popular one. <laughs> Very popular one. So make a joke of something that you're really feeling quite ashamed about. But you make a joke of it. We, we know, uh, actually, uh, Corny used to always make these sexual jokes all the time. And we've, in, the, in the art, we said to Corny, mate, you've got some sexual issues you need to address <laughs> with regard to shame. Because this is why you make these jokes all the time, you know? And a lot of them are pretty off as well. You, if you knew him five years ago, you would have thought so. And, uh, and that's, he used this sort of humour as a way to avoid the emotion. Yeah, good. David? Just push through it. Yeah, what would you call that? You'd call that... Stoicism. Yeah, stoicism. For, for me, I used to... Uh, blush at the drop of a hat until I started to work with, with people and yeah I don't get embarrassed anymore or yep. not really yeah, but, but I'm you're figuring still... there must be a whole lot of shame there that I'm, I'm not yeah, looking at that's right you learn to manage through this sort of like rigidity and stoicism yeah I don't know if I spelt that right either um, you did. I think I did um, Eloisa I'm um, like collusion like agreeing with the person saying yeah you know like kind of <laughs> Shaming yourself as well. So agreement with error. Is that like if someone's telling a dirty joke, you'll join in or you'll laugh nervously? Yeah, you know, when really you feel quite like put off inside, but you don't willing to say the truth, you know, you and, and or you might uh, you might go along with some behaviour of somebody else's because you're too ashamed to be the only person who's not doing it with the group, those kind of things where you feel a lot of it's about, uh, what's that word about uh, peer pressure? Um, what's the, another word for that? Can't remember the word. As I said, this English language thing's becoming a problem. Um, Matthew? Um, engage in shameless or shameful behaviour. Very good. Yes, yeah, so yeah, being shameless. <laughs> And can I add to that angry engagement in shameful behaviour? 
the rebellion. Yes, yeah. so it all comes under under this same category, doesn't so it? So you engage in the behaviour that you actually find shameful, but in a way of like, I'm not going to be shamed. I'm, I'm going to show them. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I'm not ashamed. A uh, lot of women do that sexually. Yeah. They have a lot of sexual shame, and then they're like, no, I'm going to be empowered in my sexuality, and get into these really. You know, like these groups where there's a lot of partner swapping and everything to be empowered. And a lot of spirits use this greatly to make the situation worse for people. There's whole groups of people that we've met in the US, in the UK, for example, where the women are involved in these sexual swapping things where, where there's a guru and some men, so just a few men, and then there's like lots and lots of women and they're all doing all of these sexual things with these men in order to improve their spirituality. And the, and the spirits with them are using this emotion in the women to, to actually engage the process and get the woman to even consider doing it. Does that make sense? Yeah. So they're using this one and this one and yeah, those two and the shameful feeling itself to, to, uh, to make that happen. Mm. It's really sad, actually, you're talking to some of them because some of them now are now so ashamed. They're so unbelievably ashamed when, you know, 10 years ago before they started the process, you know, since then they've had sex with hundreds of different of people and, and, they, and they now they feel terrible about themselves, which is the subsequent result of avoiding their original shame. Yeah. Mm. Can I just point out something emotionally that goes on? If an emotion is this big inside of you, most of the time, and the fear is this big inside of you, most of the time the trigger will only occur when you, the emotion gets bigger than the fear. And, and what you've got to do, learn to do emotionally is to reduce the fear down to there <laughs> and then you'll deal with everything as it comes up without needing more triggers. But, but the reason why we need more triggers is because the fear is at a certain level and we're unwilling to feel the fear. And as a result, if another emotion such as shame is at this level, the shame is going to have to increase above the fear before we'll actually begin addressing the, 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 fear, the shame itself, which is a sad thing really when you think about it, isn't it? It's like our own fear of the shame is it so high and so now the shame is going to have to go higher than that before we'll start addressing it. We're better off lowering the fear of the shame to nothing and then we'll need very little shame before we start addressing it. All right, that's really what the, the situation is. Yeah, Therese? At attacking others is something that... Attacking we're... others. Yes, very important. So attack of others. Yeah. Is that also shaming others? Attack and shaming others, yes. Others through shame. This is a very popular one, right? The majority of people on the planet do this, don't they? Don't they? Can, you, you, think can about you give it. me an example of how that happens in, with regards to shame? Well, I see it happening all the time. Like It's like you remember the guy um, who was on the, the radio station who interviewed us in the UK. Mm -hmm. He is basically ashamed of himself. Mm. And so what he does is he spends his whole life just attacking others yeah. and criticising others. And that's all he does. Because it, and, and it's not about anybody else. It's all about how ashamed of himself he is. Does that make sense? And he's got to pull down other people in order to feel better. If you can use a mic. Yeah. Yep. Someone who goes out of the way to point out um, shameful behaviour in other people. Yep. You know, particularly the older generation. Oh, yep. I've just noticed with my 16-year-old daughter when she's walking with her four-year-old sister... The amount of projection that, that she gets is unbelievable. If, wow. if it was her child, how are we benefiting society by walking past that young mother and going, yeah, and you know, you shouldn't have done that. Oh, yeah. you're right. Yeah, no, I should just kill my child now. Um, exactly. So that yeah. Exactly. It's like there, there's their underlying expectation almost, isn't there? That, and, but it's more about sex, isn't it? It's the old, older generation has a lot more shame about sex generally. Uh, well, it's a lot more covert shame, I should say, about yeah. sex. And so there's a lot of judgment that comes. With the younger generation, they've got uh, a shame still present that's, getting tr that's often getting triggered. But because it's this kind of one, they engage in shameless activity. And almost to go, 
you know, like the saying goes, <laughs> stuff yours, like stuff you, you know, that kind of thing, to, to the people that are judging them. But there must be a lot of shame in me for my children to attract that judgment anyway. So I agree. Yeah. yeah. Well, a lot of fear of the shame anyway. So I agree. Yes. Yeah. A lot of times we're more afraid of what's in us than what's really in us. In other words, the level of fear we have about what's in us is much worse than what's actually in us. <laughs> yeah. And that's another way I've handled shame is just to completely suppress whole aspects of my personality. Yeah. So suppression would be suppression yep. is probably um, yeah we could add that couldn't we to the list because it's running out of room. So yeah, I think suppression is more of an active. It's an active thing though. Suppression is like the active desire within yourself to suppress yourself in order to have other people think better of you. Which is actually an avoidance of your own shame in most cases. Yep. Yep. Now, the reason why I've created that list... Um, who asked the question? It was David, David that's right. The, the reason why I've created that list is, firstly, we need to know what we do before we can actually work out what is the best thing to do to solve the problem. Does that make sense? So what are your pet ways <laughs> of avoiding shame? The two big main ones really running away in the angry, rebellion, shameless. So that one, those two there? Mainly probably the shameless in the later years and then when they got even not enough, I'll do a lot more of the running away to top okay, it off. Okay, so these are your two favourites, should yep. we call them? Yep. So once you've found your favourite methods, generally what you do from an emotional perspective is that's what you engage fairly constantly. They become your, your go-to points with regard to addressing shame. What is shame really? Uh, Rachel? If I... I feel like it's a feeling... I, I kind of have it in relation to God, like I'm less than I actually could be. Right, so it's a... In your, in your, what your statement is basically saying is that it's a, it's a fear that you're not good enough for your own, for your own comparison with yourself, is that...? Maybe, yeah. Yep, so why would a person do that, though? Why would a person compare themselves constantly with them, what their potential would be? Maybe it's not so much that as I recognise that those things are in me and they're not great. You well, know? When you say they're not great, you know, like, where does that come from? <laughs> what do you mean they're not great? Well, I suppose having those feelings and then having them judged or, or having the feeling that they're not okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll simplify it for you. Okay, Is that all right? Great. No worries. <laughs> <laughs> so you remember all those things that we've really got there. The primary sources of shame are, are two. Two, just two. So does that give you an indication? <laughs> <laughs> Mum and dad, two. No, no, that's one in my opinion. There are some shames that are legitimate, are there not? Yeah. What would you call that? What would you call a shame that's sort of a legitimate shame? <laughs> Seth. <laughs> um, acting in when you realise that you've behaved unlovingly. Okay, so you could say acting out of harmony with your conscience. Mm -hmm. So there are... So if you look at shame, you've got two sides of the coin, has you? You've got firstly when you know you have behaved badly and lovingly, shall we call it, from God's perspective. So that's one source of shame, isn't it? When you feel that, you often have, feel cut to the heart, you feel like you want to improve the situation. But because of the shame, you often then want to do all those other things that we've talked about instead of just feeling repentant. And if you, th if you think about this issue here, the solution to that issue is repentance. 
Right? So it's quite a simple solution to that issue. To going through a process of feeling cut to the heart, wanting it to be different, talking to God about the cause. What, why did I do it? Why did I take this action that was unloving? What was the underlying motivation? <laughs> Baby. Um, when, yeah, sorry. <laughs> thinking sorry. I love um, how Mary experiences it. <laughs> I associate my shame with a fear that I am bad. Yes. So when I realise I've behaved unlovingly from God's perspective, often I feel a pang or a guilt and there might be shame associated with that. But when I'm in shame, it's a total feeling that that is me, I'm bad. Well, that brings us to the Which second, is, oh, okay. doesn't it? Yeah. Doesn't it? Yeah. So what's that cause of shame? Yeah. The simplest thing is environment. So, so it's how we've been brought up, what we've been taught to be ashamed of, which is not necessarily what we need to be ashamed of, and most cases isn't what we need to be ashamed of at all. Right? So this is all about other people. Other people's judgment. Does that make sense? I can feel my dissatisfied girl just sitting there. Just thinking. What, say say some things. <laughs> oh no. Um, I, sorry, I was having I was just feeling about the fact that I've been raised to be ashamed of things that are not that are good from God's perspective. Exactly. And I've been and to feel unashamed of things that are actually unloving from God's perspective. Exactly. So that's just what I was feeling. And, and this, is a, this is an important thing to, to understand. We've all been brought up in this way. That there, are, there are things from God's, perspective, from God's perspective that we've behaved unlovingly, and yet we think they're okay. And then there's other things where other people have said we've behaved unlovingly or badly, and we haven't at all. And they say, you should be ashamed of yourself. And, and there's no reason to be ashamed of yourself under those circumstances, but we often are. So what's the primary problem with shame, though? There's two, there's two problems. If you look at these are the two primary causes of shame, what are the two problems? The first problem is we're unwilling to feel repentant. So that's one, one problem with the issues that, from God's perspective, were unloving. The second problem is we are unwilling to face the truth. <laughs> that there are certain things that we're loving, but everybody else believes are unloving. Uh, we're unwilling to face that truth. Why would we be unwilling to face that truth? Matthew? Because if, we, if we're going to be in truth about that, then we're likely to get attacked. Exactly. So it's fear of being attacked by others, isn't it? Yeah. Yep. So how do you feel through that one? So if, if the answer to this one's repentance, what's the answer to this one? Um, start by telling the truth. <laughs> yes, and what will happen? There's something else you're going to need. You have to feel fear. Yep. And what allows you to feel any emotion? Humility. humility. Ah, yes. The answer to this one is humility. Oh. The answer to this one is repentance. And the answer to this one is humility. Wow. All right. Humility is, if we define it in this case, the willingness to feel and experience every emotion, which means that we're willing to feel and experience what it feels like to be attacked. In this one. And in this one, we're willing to feel and experience what it feels like to actually have done the wrong thing. Because it feels pretty bad, actually. Yep. Yep. Laura? Um, I was just thinking um, a, a huge shame that always comes up for me and I, I'm finding it hard to release is um, when I was little and engaging in something that, um, that I knew that God was looking at me and it was shameful but I wasn't 100% sure if it was but I knew that it, it wasn't. Does God ever project shame? But I was shame? little. 
So would I be repenting for something if I was trusting someone that was older and I was l like uh, I was... Uh, but you need to answer my question first. Mm -hmm. Does God ever project shame? Does God ever project judgment at anything you do? Yeah, it's the first time I've looked at it like that. No. No. Who does? Me. No. We're, you had to learn it from somewhere. Who does? Oh, my parents. Your environment, right? Other people. My environment. Right, your environment. Why did they project at you that God judged you? To make me know what was wrong and right. To no, control. to make you know what they felt was wrong or right. Um. Not to make you know what was wrong or right, what they <laughs> felt was wrong or right. They don't know God. Your mum and dad don't know God at all. So in that moment and still to this day, I felt that God was fully just looking at me, just going, you are dirty, this is wrong. And and who that's... Is, so who made you feel that? Because God doesn't judge like that. Mm. God doesn't feel anybody's dirty. And I've tried to repent for it, but it feels weak because I was like, You can't I was repent little... for it. You can't repent, repent for something that you didn't do that was, that, you know... That... that was done to me, actually. Yeah, it was something done to you. Mm. All you can do is feel the unloving behaviour of the other person. See, quite often what we're trying to do with shame is we're blaming ourselves for what others have done and then blaming others for what we need to take responsibility for. You see, what we're often doing with this one is we're blaming others, and what we're doing with this one, blaming ourselves. It's the opposite way around. We need to blame ourselves for this one and work our way through the emotion, and we need to allow the blame to be or the responsibility of judgment to go upon the people who judged us. Do you see? It's the opposite of what we do. This is why we have so much trouble with shame, is because we're constantly taught that the, we should be processing it the opposite way than what God, we would, we'd be, we would be processing it if we understood God's way. If we understood God's way, we would take responsibility for our own unloving behaviour and we would be repentant. If we understood God's way, we would also never, never, ever take responsibility for what other people did. We would place the responsibility on them for what they did. We wouldn't take responsibility for any reason for what they did. We would feel the result of the attack. Right? So a lot of what we believe is shame is actually attack from others. You wanted to say? Where do you want to go? No, no, no. Uh, what do you want to say? Up, oh, uh, we can go to Matt. Yeah, Jenna? Yeah? Yep. Then we'll go back to um, uh, It's a bit of a grey area for me. What, uh, when I was a kid, I was about 10, I used to, you know, as you're a young boy, you know, you start to feel like, oh, you know, I've got a penis. What's all this all about? You know, yeah, what's going yeah. on here? But instantly, uh, at a really young age, I felt bad about even exploring myself. Yep. And then what happened is because of that bad feeling, I became used... The denial of that made me do unloving things as a result. Of, exactly. Of that, like, you know, yeah. try to engage sexually, but I could never really receive sexually. I was yeah. always something wrong. So is that both of them linked together now, though? No, when, when you're a child... The reason why you would feel bad... The only reason why a child ever feels bad about itself sexually is because its environment feels bad about itself sexually. But what about the choices that you make after based Well, the upon choices that? you make after that's different. Yeah. But, but, but the actual cause of this problem is... is it, like, it's, it's hard to take responsibility. In fact, it's actually impossible from God's law's perspective to take responsibility for something someone else has done. You're like, religion would like to tell you otherwise. Religion tells you that I've taken responsibility for everything you've done, and that's not true. Just get busy on that, uh, would get, you? Yeah. <laughs> I know there's a lot of you who would like that to be true, right? <laughs> but, but it's not true. And this is our problem, is that we are often, as children, asked to take responsibility for what other people do, right? Or what other people think, or what other people feel. And in particular, we're asked to take responsibility for what our parents feel, think and do. And that is what causes a lot of the judgment to come towards us. Yeah, because, you know, it's dirty at the stage of a young... And then it actually really does become dirty. Like, I mean... Well, it only becomes dirty because you deny the emotion. Right. Yeah. It doesn't become dirty by, by natural course of events. It becomes dirty because you act upon the denial of the judgment. Do you follow? Mm -hmm. 
So in other words, other people have judged you. You've felt the judgment. You've felt the attack. You feel it as, as terrible. But then what you do is you deny it and then act in your denial. And that's what causes these things to occur. If you never acted in your denial, you would only have to feel that one set of emotions. You would only have to feel other people who have judged me, feels terrible, I know I'm going to get attacked if I have a different opinion. You'd feel the terror of their attack perhaps and so forth, but you'd work through the issue without having to do, go through repentance. But for the majority of us what ha happens is we feel other people's judgment. Because of that, we decide to go along with their judgment, deny the emotion, and in the process of denying the emotion, we then take actions for which we are behaving badly from God's perspective or behaving out of harmony with love that we are going to have to repent for at some point in the future. And this is the conundrum we face with shame. The problem with shame is there is a mixture of things going on. It's not all clear cut. Mm. One part is that it's all about other people's judgment, but the other part is we have done things that are out of harmony with love that we need to be repentant for. And if you were willing to be humble, you would feel both sets of emotions. It's only our inability to be humble that causes us to then take actions as I listed. What do I do when I'm in this shameful place? All of those actions are the avoidance of humility. The avoidance of taking, feeling the actual emotion. But when you go through shame, you start realising this separation. When you actually feel it properly as an emotion, you realise there is this separation that occurs inside of you. You start to see the true cause of each shame. And some of those causes you see as legitimate, ones that you are going to have to feel repentance about, in your future and whenever they are legitimate the only solution is repentance in other words you can't blame other people or you know think it's other people's judgment when it's actually been something you've chosen to do <coughs> and hope to cure it you can only go through this kind of emotion by being repentant and the only way to go through this kind of emotion is by association of associating the attack that you received or the judgment that you received from others and feeling about that judgment. That's the only way to go through that emotion. The irony is if you try to do that with those emotions, repentance, so I'll just write repentance down at the bottom here. Have I got a long enough arm for that? And this one is humility. So in other words, just the willingness to feel an emotion. Repentance is more than just a willingness to feel an emotion. It's a desire to correct, a desire to change, a desire like there's a lot more involved in repentance, right? But, but, and a repentance is also about your, your willingness to see what you've done to others, right? So there's a lot involved in repentance. Now, if you try to do repentance on this issue, you'll never cure it. And if you try to just be humble to this issue, and think, but it's, think that it's associated with another person's emotions, you'll never cure it. You have to, the only cure is the actual thing that relates to the specific problem as to who was responsible. In other words, with shame, you've got to, in the end, find out who's responsible. <laughs> Does that make sense, everyone? That's the underlying thing that we need to do. Find out who's responsible. Who's responsible for that? Me. Who's responsible for that? My environment, not me. I only have to feel the emotions, but I'm not responsible for the creation of the shame here. So it's a, I can't feel shame that other people are responsible for. I've got to feel attack. Or judgment. Or judgment. Right? Which is a different emotion to release that one. Yeah? Oh, um, we go straight back. To yeah, the um, I find I sweat out of the arms a fair bit yep. lately, and <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> it. <laughs> Actually, I'm not a, when I if I'm crying and or releasing. Sometimes I find I, I do get body odor. Yeah, but it's I don't find that as bad. But I do find I, I do sweat a lot, and I'm wondering is that fear, shame, that sort of stuff, or, or that? It's my question. When you say you sweat a lot, 
Um, there's a difference between just sweating a lot and the smell of your sweat and, like, all of those things have a different cause. Yeah. So... So... so, so I don't feel like I have – like the sweat is very smelly at the moment. Yeah. But I, do f- but I do find that frustrating that I sweat under the arms. Yeah. Mm. And it wets my T-shirt and I'll change my T-shirt. In certain yeah. situations, Paul? Or just... yeah, yeah. Yeah. Like, uh, like when I've got fear come up when I'm out in public. Yeah. And if I'm processing and different yeah. times like that. Yeah. yeah. So, so that is a lot about shame and fear, the sweating under the arms without the smell. When it's with the smell, it's a lot about toxins coming out of you at the same time, which is, which is a little different. Like, it could be from all sorts of causes. That, it just depends. But, but usually it's about shame and fear, the sweating that goes on. Yeah. I remember when Mary first started doing <laughs> public speaking. <laughs> she'd say, I'm soaked through, you know. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Okay, thank you. Straight behind you. Um, so, so. I was just wondering, um, for myself, I often slide into the pain and the guilt and I'm thinking that's to avoid the shame. Totally. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, be careful of guilt because guilt, guilt, uh, there, there is the truth of guilt, which is I have personally done something wrong that's un- un- unloving. That's like a, the term guilty conscience. Mm. But the normal guilt that most people get involved in is more an avoidance of... Um, a deeper emotion. Yeah, I think I use it as an avoidance. Yeah, most people do. Yeah. yeah. So when I say use it, maybe we can come up with some examples. What's some good examples of that? Um, so when I do something that is... Yeah, I notice that I haven't cleaned up around the house and that you're doing it after me. And I go into this feeling of guilt. Oh, he's having to do that. Oh, I should have done that. Oh, and it's really sort of self-attack that feels like to me, which is just me avoiding, why didn't I do that? Why didn't I clean up in the first place? You know? And there must be an emotional reason why. Yeah. yeah. I think that's what I do sometimes. Yeah. yeah. So, so guilt in that regard helps you skip over the actual cause. It helps you get away from the actual cause. And it causes a lot of people to go and apologise well, I do lots of that as well. <laughs> but in the end, it's yeah. not sincere because you're not yeah. addressing the actual cause. Yeah, it's, it's a total avoidance. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like a guy leaving his clothes all over the, over the house all the time and then women have to come along after him and pick it all up all the time. And every time now he notices it, he goes, oh, I'm sorry, I did it again. He's not sorry, but he's apologising. He's not sorry because he's not willing to address the cause. Why does he do it? Mm. Like, when you're sorry, when you're really sorry... You want to address the cause. You don't want to focus on fixing the effect. Yeah. So, yes, this is important to understand, this relationship between shame and what you need to be or need to feel repentant for in comparison to what you just need to feel about. Right? And most people get those two things mixed up. You know what they do? They try to be repentant for how, they're, how they were a bad child. Yeah. And, in fact... There are psychological, uh, psychological um, processes nowadays and also religious processes that tell you that you were the problem as a child. You know, that, that's what that... Um, there's a thing here in Australia that does that, isn't there? That basically Definitely. they educate any person who goes along to believe that, that the only problems you have with your parents are because you were a bad child. Right? And that is hooking into this. That's basically trying to be repentant for somebody else's responsibility. And it's impossible. You're never, you're never going to cure anything that way. Does that make sense? Yeah. And there's a group of spirits who drive that particular thing who are like parents who want to blame their child. Like, yep. And then there's others who are the opposite of that. They don't want to... They try to be humble to an emotion that they think somebody else has created when they were the cause of it. In other words, they do something wrong and then they say, oh, that's because my mum and dad did this. And it's not. You doing something wrong is not because your mum and dad did something. It's because you chose to do something wrong. (laughs) Does that make sense? You chose to do something unloving. And that's a personal responsibility if you chose it. With this, somebody else chose it. With this, you chose it. 
There's a big difference between those two places. Yeah. And quite often I see people trying to be humble to an emotion that, that they themselves, that's related, that they want to, to have related to a parent when it was they themselves who did it. And then sometimes I see people trying to be repentant for what their parents did. <laughs> and both things won't work in terms of addressing your shame. You were going to say? Nope, nope. I wasn't. I wasn't. Matt had his hand up. Do you Matt's got ask? his hand up. Yeah. I did before, but um, uh, m- my question is like, what is it in the like? What is it that stops the child in that process of humility way back when that happened? Always the parent. Yeah, but why does the child stop feeling? Because of what the parent taught them to do. So you see, when the child was young and the parent blamed it, the child would cry. Yeah. What does the parent normally do? Say, shut up or I'll give you something to cry about. Oh, and then that emotion stuck in and them. And then that emotion stuck. Get it. That, that emotion is stuck in them. And now they even feel ashamed about having the emotion. Mm. And they feel like they're going to be treated violently yeah. if they release it. So it's like forcefully being blocked. Forcefully being blocked by the parent, yes. I get it. So the only reason yeah. why we're not humble to those emotions is because we've been forcefully blocked by our parents or our environment at some point in our past. Mm. And then you just keep rolling with it. And you just keep rolling with it, you keep doing it, you keep doing it, you keep denying it, shutting it down, not wanting to feel it. And, and that's because you still want their approval. You still want, you're still looking for their approval, their acceptance, mm. their way of doing things. That's the only reason why we don't revert to humility because a child, you, yeah. you look at a child, as soon as it feels something, what does it do? It just cries. Just, if it's sad, bang, cries. Yeah. If it's shame, ashamed, it blushes <laughs> instantly. Like There's no delay, there's no suppression. right? Mm. The reason why? Mm. Because it has not been shut down. But, but we get shut down as a child over and over and over again. By the time we're an adult, we are so in tune with our parents' emotions Mm. that we have so totally detuned from our own. And they just want to make excuses for them in a way and agree with them. And yes, we want to agree with them, make excuses for them, tell ourselves that it, it all happened because you know, they were, you know, had bad things happen to them and so forth. No, it happened because they chose. Just like all the bad things you do happen because you chose. <laughs> no other reason. Does that make sense? There are plenty of people on this planet who have been abused sexually who have chosen to not abuse another person sexually. Aren't there? So you can't say that a person who's been abused sexually is always going to abuse another person sexually because it's about a choice. There are plenty of people who have been abused sexually who have chosen to abuse another person sexually. Almost all pedophiles fall into that category. Right? where they've been abused sexually themselves and then chosen to abuse another person sexually as a result. Right? There's a difference between your choice and what has been forced upon you. There's a big difference between those two places. Now, what a lot of people who abuse have done is they abuse you and then they tell you that it's your fault. That's not true. It's not your fault. You can't be repentant for something you didn't do. You can only be humble to the feelings that somebody else did it to you and be confused and cry about why they did that, why did they want to do that to you. Because at the end of the day, there was no reason inside of you why that happened. There's no reason inside of you why somebody would revert to damaging you. Right? So you can't be repentant for something that, that somebody else has done. You can only be repentant for something you actually did. And if you've been abused as a child, you can't be repentant for being abused as a child because it wasn't your fault. Somebody else did it to you. All you can do is be humble to the emotion that somebody else did it to you and, and wonder why and, and let yourself feel through those feelings about why they did it, but it wasn't because of you that they did it. They did it for another reason, a selfish reason of their own. Yeah. Matthew? I think it's really hard when you've been told and you've gone with that projection that it was your fault for all of your life. It's only hard because we don't wish to accept God's truth because 
we know that if we do accept God's truth, we're going to be attacked more. So the only thing that really makes it hard is knowing that when we accept God's truth, we're going to be attacked more by that person. Does that make sense? That's what makes it hard. And a lot of the time we want the love from that person, don't we? Because Still. we didn't receive it. And so we almost feel needy for their love. But to actually acknowledge the truth means that we're going to distance ourselves. Even they, more. Yeah, they, they're not going to give us anything resembling love until they work through the issue. And this is about being humble to the emotion of feeling like, no matter how much love I want from that person, they're never going to give it to me. And just feeling how bad that feels. Feeling, feeling about why you feel they're never going to give it to you. I hate that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and if someone doesn't love you, it's not your fault. Thanks. And this is a really important thing to understand from an emotional perspective. If someone doesn't love you, it is not your fault. Because love is a gift. Anybody could give it to anybody else, no matter what they do. If someone chooses to not love you, then it is not your fault that they don't love you. It's something going on within them that causes them to not love you. And, and we need to come to an emotional recognition of that, that it's not our fault that we're not loved. Does that make sense? See, God loves us no matter how bad we get. <laughs> No matter, no matter what we choose to do, God still loves us. No matter what, how, how devious and dark we get with our decisions, God still loves us. And the reason why God still loves us through all of that is because God loves us. And it's immaterial whether what you do as to whether God will continue loving you. You might not feel it. That's a different issue. But the reality is God loves you through all that. If people on earth don't love you through all of that, then it's because they have chosen to not love you. And that's not your fault. That's their choice. They have chosen to not love you. And it's very important to understand that. Yeah. Very important for your emotional processing to understand that, actually. Yeah. Just because you're not loved, it doesn't mean that you're unlovable. It means that somebody chose to not love you. And that was their choice. It's immaterial what you did. It was their choice. You can be as bad as you want or as good as you want. Other people could still choose to love you. God chooses to love you through all of it. And someone who really loves us, loves us no matter how we behave. Yep. So you can't earn the love of a person of someone who really loves you. They already love you. There's nothing you can do to make them love you more because they already love you. They, they, all want, they want to love you. And they want to love you whether you're bad or good. They still want to love you. And there's nothing you can do about that. You can't earn it and you can't make a big mistake that would cause it to stop. God will still love you all through that. And the person who loves you on earth will love you through all that. And this is, I feel, one of our primary problems is we don't believe that. We, we, we feel that, that we've got to earn the love of others and that when we make mistakes, we're not going to be loved. That's not the case at all. A person who really wants to love you will love you even if you make a mistake. A person who really wants to love you will love you even if you purposefully do something wrong. They'll still love you because they want to love you. And their love of you is not dependent upon what you do. Yeah. And that's how we all can learn how to love. Get to that point where we're willing to love other people no matter what they do. No matter what actions they take. Whether, even if they want to kill us, we still love them. Now, if you lived in an environment like that, that would be a pretty powerful environment, wouldn't it? To grow up in and to experience and to enjoy we wouldn't be worried about shame or any other emotion. Yeah. And perhaps that's a good place to leave our discussion yeah. today. How about that? Just to remind you that if someone really loves you, they will love you 
no matter what. And God, who really does love you, loves you no matter what mistakes you make. Even if you do things on purpose, God still loves you. Even if you do things in avoidance, God still loves you. You might not be able to feel that love while you do those particular things, but God will still love you through all of that. Right? And it's very important to understand that because then you're going to be less afraid about making a mistake. <laughs> you're going to be less afraid about that it's all you, that there's something wrong with you. Like from God's perspective, God created you, the perfect person. The, the highest of God's creations. That's how, what God created. So God loves you because God loves God's own creations. God knows everything about you, knows everything you've done, everything you're going to do, everything that is inside of you, already knows all that. There's nothing you can do to impress God. <laughs> He's already impressed. He's already impressed. He's already impressed with his own creation. All right? There's nothing you can do to make God disgusted. Because God doesn't feel disgust that God gave you the gift of free will to make a choice. God knows that you know, whenever you make a choice that's out of harmony with love, that you'll feel some pain and maybe you'll think about that. But, but God doesn't feel disgusted with you. It's only people that do these things. It's only people that do these things. So if, if we can get to the point where we understand that about God and we also understand that about each other, that a person who loves us doesn't judge us, a person who loves us doesn't, always loves us no matter what we do. And if that's not the case in our recurrent relationships, then we can go, well, wow, I've got no one in my life who really loves me. Right? And we can feel about that and grieve that, but in the end you'll realise that you've got God who really loves you. You've got all of our spirit friends who have been perfected in love who love you. Your guide who's probably perfected in love loves you. So there's a lot of people who love you. A lot of them you just can't see. But, but on earth, if we can get to the point where we love other people because... We want to. Not because of what they do, but because we want to. And if you're ever with a person who loves you because they want to love you and not because of what you do, you'll find you'll be able to process through your emotions a lot more rapidly than what you can currently believe. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, that was a good uh, discussion, guys. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. So um, we're down for a week or so, and uh, so next week on Saturday we're going to have another session if you want to come along, and it will just be another question and answer session as well where we'll just answer questions. So if you didn't get a chance to ask your question today, we'd be happy to answer your questions next week as well. Mm. But thanks for your time today. Guys. Thanks, everyone. Yeah.